few people on standby if this does if this doesn't work out you know these myco celebrities they are unpredictable much like the mushies that we know and love to grow anyway uh <clears throat> just wanted to give a, a little shout out to my discord group um, I did a, a few giveaways during Thanksgiving, and one of my buddies uh, on, on Discord there, uh, Corner, recommended. He said, hey, man, we should do a 12 Days of Christmas giveaway. And I was like, yes, we should definitely do that. So uh, we put the word out and got a lot of people who were ready to spread some holiday cheer and do some giveaways. So for the last five days, we've been doing that, uh, if you guys didn't know. I'm going to pull up uh, my little uh, 12 Days of Christmas giveaway. Um, brought to you by Mike Geeky Podcast, members of the Roundtable. Anyway, uh, so for example, uh, if you guys haven't been keeping up for today, uh, we're on five golden rings, guys. Uh, we did the four calling birds, three French hens, two turtle doves, and we did the partridge in a pear tree. Um, shout out to all the, the sponsors who uh, sponsored uh, the first four days. Um, Today, Mycology Simplified, Spencer Shroomery, and then my buddy St. Vader, uh, all sponsoring the giveaway for the day. Anyway, you can see what's going on each day on uh, Instagram and on Facebook. And always, of course, on my Discord. Anyway, um, so yeah, we're, uh, we're just trying to get the ball rolling here, guys. I'm going to put you on a very brief uh, hold. I'm going to play uh, a little song one of my, my buddies back in California and I we're working on uh give me like one minute i'm gonna let you guys uh enjoy the music and i'm gonna make sure jake's ready to go For the soul and it's no fear Psychedelic universe and a new kid You can feel the power rise when you come near Oh, magic mushroom, can you give me more power? Super Mario, I'm about to be Bowser Was chilling with a turtle while sitting in the shower On my GameCube that I fix in an hour Then I heard this podcast, nothing you can bypass Heard how to grow, then I tell myself right that All the real people listen Put it in the word, cause you know what's the mission Yeah Okay, guys, here we go. Trip, we're tripping up tonight, just a little bit. Couple, we've been doing a lot of tripping. Let's just say that. Uh, okay, uh, so tonight, uh, from uh, the the depths of the Swiss Alps, we have uh, somebody who ironically grows some very tropical, uh, very spicy mushrooms. Um, he is probably synonymous with uh this variety of mushroom uh the species and uh he is absolutely the guy the guy that galvanized uh all the cultivation tech uh, uh, around pan science um i'm talking about uh jake on said he is uh pretty much a legend i don't look man i've never even grown him but he's a legend uh if you've been in this community even for a brief period of time you know this this he's the man and uh, 
So we are going to see uh, how his audio sounds. Give me one second here. Uh, so without further ado, let me welcome uh, Jake Onsed. What's up, brother? Hey, can you hear me? Uh, I can. I don't know. Either you got to turn that mic up or you got to get closer to... Hey, hold up. How about now? Sometimes oh, I yeah. hold my phone with my finger in the exact wrong spot. M much, much better, much better. Yes, <laughs> great. Cool, and you got the logo. Perfect. Looks good. All you right, know, man. I got that done in like 10 seconds. I was like, oh, Avatar. So then I copied it off my Facebook. Perfect. <laughs> You know, you could, if you can crank that volume a little bit, you, you probably could even buy yourself some more volume. Here, let me see. Do I do it from inside here, or? You can, yeah. So there's a settings tab. Um, I don't know what it looks like on a phone. I got it. Settings, yep, and then just... audio, phone, microphone. And then uh, for all the, the listeners, uh I mean, I, I'm monitoring it, but you can also provide feedback if you think it's sounding good or if, if you want a little more audio. How's that? I'm liking that. Mm -hmm. Is that better? That is, that sounds pretty good. Okay, I'll take cool. it. Cool, man. Well, thanks for being here. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Got off to a little rocky start, but here we go. Um, so, as a lot of people know, I've only been growing mushrooms for a year. So, I mean, I'm... Who am I? I'm fucking nobody. Uh, you, however, are somebody. Um, <laughs> when I first started uh, a year ago, you know, scouring the shroomery to figure shit out, it did not take me long to run across your name and see that you knew how to do a, a thing or two. Um, and though I have only gotten as far as uh, germinating some pan cyan uh, Puerto Ricos on a plate that ultimately fizzled and, and didn't do much, um, I'm hoping that'll change uh, after tonight and get a little inspiration from the, uh, the, the, the pan man himself. So thank you so much for being here. Um, I would love to talk. Um, I do this with everybody. I, you know, we just like to get to know everybody who comes on. And uh, one of the first ways um, I do that is by asking you about your, like, your, your first mu mushy memory. Like, like how are you... Some people, you know, hated mushrooms growing up and then they had an experience in college or some people like mushrooms their whole life. Um, I, I know you kind of have a unique story of, of how you came to mushrooms and I, I, we didn't get a chance to talk ahead of time. So I don't know how much of this you're willing to talk about, but I'd love to hear the story uh, that, that germinated your name and uh, ultimately changed your life. Yeah, absolutely. So um, when I was in high school, I... Uh got interested in weed pretty pretty early like by middle school i had a, a close friend who had three older brothers and they all smoked weed and uh i found myself smoking weed you know sixth grade and okay. uh pretty much identified myself as a pothead and pretty much everyone else identified me as that also and uh i my i met one friend who was a couple years older who kind of supplied me with weed there for a little bit and he was really into mushrooms or at least into growing cubes and he uh he was growing penis envy and he brought me someone or some one night and uh, i ate him and i absolutely loved him and uh he showed me not nothing special you know pf tech and uh right. i kind of got kind of got a feel for you know the basics of it and then right. he had now uh, how long ago is this how far back are we talking oh this would have been uh let's see i'm like 34 now and i was probably 15 or 14 when this happened okay. all right so you're like you're uh, way back okay. yeah a while ago yeah and he had a friend that i guess got him into mushrooms who was this old hippie guy that lived on the mount he lived up on the, top, the very top of a, a mountain nearby Love me it. and uh, that guy was uh, was really into planting uh, wood lovers outdoors. So he had a couple different patches where he had put azies, which are not native to where I'm at, mm -hmm. and he had uh, some ovioids and um, cyanescence. And of course, you know the first time I had those, the difference between those and the cubes I'm getting right. was eaten off of cakes was completely different. Right. And uh, I spent some time with him learning how to do the outdoor patches and uh 
pretty much that that was that was pretty much what you know the 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 most of what I got done in high school. And uh, so, were you, know, you ever that, around? Were you ever around his his old hillbilly mountain hermit guy, or was it you were just <laughs> learning from your buddy? No, I, I met the other guy, Hippie Dan, we uh, called cool, him. Cool, cool, uh, nice. Uh, I he, love that. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> nice. he, uh, he, he taught me directly how to do the outdoor patches. My other friend, his name was Joey, he uh, he was more interested in, like, he was kind of like, he, he liked to be really secretive, and he mm -hmm. didn't like people, like, knowing what, was, what he was getting into, but I pretty much figured sure. out that it was BF Tech, and he kind of... He tried to make it sound more complicated to me when I would ask what? him about it. People don't do that, do they? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. Um, but anyway, so I, uh, you know, I, I absolutely loved the effects of being on them. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, it was like a, a whole new world to me. And I, um, I really thought that, you know, everything about, you know, growing them and taking them was just... It really connected with me, and I was like, "This feels like where I should be." Yeah. And then uh, I kept following down, you know, a, that some, you know, a similar rabbit hole into like all drugs. And I was like, "Well, if I like mushrooms and weed this much, what, let's try what else am I? Yeah, what else am I gonna like? Let's <laughs> try it. Yeah, right. Sure. And uh, that that ended bad. Um, I I quickly learned how to doctor shop. And uh, I started getting into pharmaceuticals wow. and then non-pharmaceutical opiates and right. Um, and now, how, so how long was that? What? How long of a period of time was that? Uh, I mean, it, it was on and off for a while. I uh, the, the whole doctor thing went on for about three or four years, and yeah. then they shut down. The, the you used to be able to go to doctors in different states. Right. And fill as many prescriptions as you want, and then just the the pharmacies didn't care. You could fill six right. different prescriptions from all different doctors at one pharmacy, and wow. as long as they were getting their money, they didn't care. And that's right. what all those lawsuits now are about. And I think Walmart just paid out a uh, uh, couple million mm -hmm. dollars to the opioid relief fund, or or so something along mm -hmm. those lines. But Walmart just made a very generous donation for. Uh, their hand in the opioid right. epidemic and uh i filled a lot of prescriptions with them so good on them <laughs> that's good um but yeah so i uh eventually i ended up moving out to colorado and i was a snowboard instructor cool and i uh i started growing mushrooms out there and that was the first time i really had like a, my own indoor uh setup going for me and right. again it was nothing fancy it was mostly grain to grain transfers and i would uh i would put them to straw logs that i would right. have okay uh stacked vertically in closets so like they would be about four foot long six to eight inches in diameter and the mushrooms would grow all the way around them kind of like uh brushes <laughs> like okay. mushroom yeah, brushes that's cool. And, uh, but yeah, nothing, nothing super fancy, no breeding, nothing like that. Just, mm -hmm. uh, four syringes to grain and then G to G transfers and a lot of contaminated jars. Right. Um, so and now then, is, uh, is this still all like pre shroomery and this is oh, just yeah. you, you from the stuff Dan taught you, you're just, you're going to town. Yeah, that yeah. Well, Dan taught mostly taught me outdoor patches, and I did oh, plant okay. a few outdoor patches. But those are those take so long to come to fruition up. from the time you start them. Yeah. Um, and I did have a couple going. And there's actually probably still a couple uh, patches out there uh, out around Breckenridge that I started nice. when I was out there that I never got to. That's um, hilarious. But, uh, yeah, no, I, I hadn't been on Shroomery, really. I'd read some people's stuff, but I hadn't made right. a, I hadn't made a profile or anything. I was, uh, talking with, uh, you know, remember Hawkeyes.com, Rich Hawk. Mm -hmm. uh, him and I became buddies, and I, I ordered a lot of uh, syringes from him, and I talked to him a little bit, but I, you know, beyond, uh, 
spore syringe inoculation into grain jars and G to G transfers right. and a, a still air box. It was pretty, uh, pretty basic. Right. So anyway, I ended up, and I was doing other stuff in Colorado too that was more nefarious. And I ended up deciding I should get out of Colorado in a hurry. And uh, I ended up um, eventually, you know, my uh, my drug addiction came to a head. I did some time in prison. I got clean, completed like a, a nine month rehab, and then uh, clean for a few years and got married and got a house and some kids. And then I started uh, reading on the Facebook groups and back on Shroomery. And I don't know, I just I felt like I really missed that part of my life before. Like there was a lot about my life before that I did not miss at all, but I always really enjoyed mushrooms. And I felt like the more I got away from them, the more trouble I got into. Like hmm. in Colorado, I don't think I ate them, but a couple times because every time I'd eat them, I'd start to feel bad about my other drug use. And I just, I didn't want to feel bad about it. That's very interesting. <laughs> yes yeah the truth serum exactly yeah. so i um i ordered a couple uh different prints and i um started doing a lot more reading and kind of took it slow and i uh grew cubes a few times and with everything i had done my stomach had been pretty banged up and eating cubes was pretty rough um yeah, so i uh I got some pan science and from what I had found, there wasn't, I mean, there was a couple of different grow techs that uh, people had posted that, you know, some of them had decent results, but when you looked in the comments and people responding, you didn't have a whole lot of people showing their uh, success following that oh. method or at least not continual posts. Right. Um, so this actually I, reminds me, uh, Wumbo Maiko made a comment saying, he was like, you know, shroomery seven years ago, it, it, there weren't texts. It was just, this is what I did, and then this is what I did. And you didn't really know if it was a good tech or not. You'd have to almost just try it and figure it out. Exactly. And yeah. what, I, what I learned later with pans especially is sometimes you just get lucky and get a dynamite culture that's going to kick ass for you. I don't want to say no matter what, but despite mm -hmm. non-optimal conditions. And then, so I think what would happen is some people would stumble across that and then be like, you know, ooh, this is, this is how I got this done. And then a bunch of people would try and replicate it doing what they did and it wouldn't work out great for them. Right. And, uh, yeah, so but pretty much the common denominator I saw from everyone that was having decent success with them was they uh, were, trying, were, were maximizing the evaporation they were getting off the... Uh, right the surface of their substrate. So I kind of went forward with that you know, at the center of, um, of the tech I was going to write was how do I maximize evaporation without drying out my substrate or drowning my mushrooms. Right. And uh, I went through a couple different prototypes. I did one, one attempt with uh, tubs, which eventually I did get to work. The problem was... When things went wrong, you were wasting so much material. Oh. And when things went right, you had so many, so many caps that you know, it was too much to print or right. eat or do anything with. So it was kind of it, it get a whole mono tub full of one strain. And my, my goal was to um, provide spores, you know, just like up to now. So I wanted to be able to do more variety. So I kind of adapted the tub system to the to the tent. And, uh, yeah, I, uh, Jarthas, <laughs> as you call them. The what? Jarthas, as you yeah, call Jarthas. them. Yeah, Jarthas. Yep. Not Marthas. Jarthas. Not if there's pans in them. <laughs> Jarthas. Yeah. Well, well, the main difference was a lot of people with the, with the original Martha tent, they had like an ink bird and they were kind of holding a constant humidity so they right. kept their humidity at you know whatever it was that they they wanted to keep it at but what i wanted to do was i wanted to cycle the the, the humidity right. between wet and dry to try and uh, maximize 
the, the evaporation. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I don't ever use the, uh, uh, ink birds or uh, what are they? Hydro- hydrometers. Right. Yeah. And uh, I just kind of go off of the surfing the surface condition of the trays. Um, gotcha. But I definitely found pretty quickly that you need to have some sort of, or at least for how I was doing it, you had to have some automated system unless you wanted to hand hydrate your trays 15 times a day. It was just, right. it was hard to do it without some kind of automated system. But but now, Jake, you can pretty much have like the, the Jake uh, internship program and you could just have noobs who love to stare at mushrooms all day anyway. Uh, I, you could have them att- uh, you know, attend to your 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 cake's hydration needs. <laughs> I guess I could do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you you really you, you need to automate that cycling for sure. Um so yeah, so then I and I started when I first made the first tent, I just used a um like a like a regular room humidifier. Mm-hmm. So it had a single dish and then the 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 water reservoir was like a tower and it came up through the right. top. And uh, I found that I had uh, hot spots in the tent where the trays would only really do well if they were oh. positioned in the right spot in the tent. Um, so then I increased the uh, the size of the foggers I would use, and I ended up using the House of Hydro uh, fogger discs. Yeah. And I found that pretty much six discs per tent is uh, is the sweet spot where you you won't have any of those hot spots in, in your tent. And it'll be able to fog load the whole thing, and nice. uh, all the shelves will be equal. Um, and then and you, the exhaust- and so I'm thinking, you know, you really only figure that out if you basically have trays everywhere, so that you can see if it has hot spots or dry spots or wet spots or, or whatever. exactly, right. yeah. You got to really sort of, you got to cover every inch of those shelves. And then the same thing as the, you know, as the seasons changed and it, uh, right. you know, at the, the, the uh, humidity and temperature changed outside, I'd have to recalibrate the stuff yeah. um, in the tents. And then even with like the different, the different species within pans, like by, by sporus, it needs to be much wetter for them to be happy. Mm-hmm. And, uh. You gotta you gotta get that dialed in so that they they stay as wet as they need it without floating the substrate. Um, but yeah, and then the the exhaust fans. At first, I was using just bathroom uh, bathroom exhaust fans, which obviously are not waterproof. So I had to replace them every couple months, and right. I finally found a waterproof exhaust blower on Amazon. Um, and that thing is awesome. So nice. now I only need one blower to power both tents, and it never breaks down on me. And uh, yeah, so it it took it took a while for me to get everything dialed in to where it was actually, you know, what I wanted it to be, and not just what I could make happen. Um, and now, then so the- uh, let me ahead. just say real quick. That willingness to, and that goal, having that goal of like, no, I'm not okay with just half this pan, you know, making fruit and the other half not. Some people would have just said, okay, cool, this corner is, you know, this is where it's going to happen, I guess. And so I think you being a little more methodical and wanting more from that tent and, and seeking out different parts and all that, that, I think that is definitely a testament to why ultimately you got everything so dialed in too yeah and i uh well with, with cubes i kept seeing people trying to reinvent the wheel with like wanting to do cubes a completely different way and i just didn't see the need for it you, you can right. consistently put up loaded mono tubs one after the other pr- you pretty can. easily i just really didn't see a need for more investigation there well, if you're like me, you start off, and in the first four or five months, you get nothing but canopies and massive fruits, and then you go, you know what? I want to fuck around some more, and I want to <laughs> ruin all that, and I want to try a thousand other things, and I do. I mean, I know I can always go back to to the other stuff. I, I enjoy farting around with it, but you are totally right. 
it's been figured out, right? Like, you don't... I know guys that only grow on core, like nothing else. No, no vermiculite, no perlite, no azomite, no none of the fucking ites. Just yep, core, that's me. And for, it works. For, for cubes, it's just cocoa core and monotubs. Yep. <laughs> so, yeah, you really, you don't... And when I talk to newbies, I just say... Look, man, if you, however simple you can keep it in the beginning, because if something's fucking up, the less shit you're doing, the easier it is for somebody to help you figure out what you're doing wrong. If you're doing 90 experiments simultaneously, right? Like, how do you help that person? Right. <laughs> you, just can't. you don't even know where to begin. You don't and know where to begin. The, uh, you you want to figure out, like, what are you trying to accomplish with what you're experimenting right. with. I feel like a lot of people just say, oh, experimenting with this to what end? What, right. what is it that you are expecting to happen, best case scenario? Right. And uh, I guess more potency is... is I, think, I think here. many people are hoping there's some magic sauce. Yep. I mean, there's, there's a church right now, some... Uh, you know, uh, I guess a couple lawyers started this church, and uh, they put DMT in their substrate, and apparently <laughs> they have like DMT yep. in place, right? Yeah, I've heard of that, and then uh, yeah. even marijuana in the substrate. I've had a couple of people now say sure. that they uh, were trying to get THC in their mushrooms. Right. I mean, I just, in my head, I just go so. Why do we need to put them in together? You just eat one and, and smoke, smoke the, the other. other. <laughs> yep. Why has it got to be in the same thing? Uh, I don't know. Well, in the the thing, just because something is present doesn't mean that or the, right. the, the mushroom is going to all of a sudden adapt and and right. learn how to absorb that into its fruit bodies. N not in our lifetimes. Yeah. <laughs> Probably not. Yeah. Um. um so you you were uh, so you were working on getting this dialed in. You you finally found the gear that was allowing you to cycle things the right way. Can you talk a little bit? I'm gonna go back. We're gonna kind of go through agar, grain, sub, all that stuff. But real quick, I I I like this evaporation process. Uh, one of my buddies a long time ago was the first guy to tell me. He goes, dude, you don't get it, do you? You know, you're you're like peaking, you're misting, you're doing all this shit. He's like. It's an evaporation process. And this was for cubes, so there was no cycles. But he was like, you just got to start at field capacity. You let it colonize. When it's fully colonized, you introduce fruiting conditions. And it's just going to start evaporating. And he's like, and yep. you're going to get fucking mushrooms. Chill the fuck out. You're just going to get them. And yep. uh, as soon as I listened to that guy, I was like, oh my god, he's so right. It's, it's just the evaporative process. And anytime we have stalls or problems, it's because we interrupted and altered that evaporation process. But now what's interesting to me about the pans is you're you're like purposely, it's like you're fucking with them. You're like, oh, we're going to dry out. Nope, we're going to get you wet a little bit. No, nope, we're going <laughs> to dry it. So how did you come up with that cycling process? Well, so with cubes, you can you have your substrate can be so much thicker that you can really load all the moisture you're going to need for oh, your yield in the into the substrate. So you know you have six eight six eight inches of cocoa core and spawn, and cocoa core holds a good bit of moisture. So all the water that they need for that first flush is already in the substrate. Right. Okay. And it'll have enough to carry it through to the first flush. And then you harvest I it see. and then rehydrate your substrate and go for a second flush. With pans, they really don't they, – they, they smother them. They smother really easily. So you really can't go deeper than three inches I see. without having issues. Now I'm gonna just I'm gonna also say I think I just heard you say six to eight inch cakes for uh, for cubes. Well, tubs. I, oh, for tubs. Okay. I'm like, uh, I mean, still that's deep. I don't I don't think I've ever gone that deep. I think four inches is. Yeah, four to five is usually where I keep it. But I've seen okay. some monster tub. You ever see the pictures where people I... cut the plastic away and they put the whole big block up? Oh, there? yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. I've seen that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. So, the I so keep there, my, uh, my filter patches on my monotubs. I like to keep the. I cut square holes 
for my for my filter patches, okay. and I like to keep the substrate directly below the uh, right the cutout so that it's right there across the surface. Yeah, like you go through four. you go through the effort to really make sure your your cake line comes right up to there. Yep, is what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, I, I've noticed that if. So I have this little max yield tub, which I, I'm not, you know, if, if you got money to spend and you don't want to make a tub, fine, buy it. Um, but I did a grow where I was a good inch below their like 400,000, you know, lower holes. And I did not have a great grow with it. So I was like, ah, shit, I didn't get that, that cake level dialed in. That's, that yeah, because air will get trapped right there. And right. then you'll have builds of buildups where it can't yeah. escape because... The way a mono tub work is the is the holes along the broad side. Yeah. That's actually where your air or your gases flow out, and then the air right. comes in through the upper uh, yeah. at, uh, cutouts on the, right. on either end. Yeah, but if if your cake is two inches or an inch below the lower side holes, now you have this pocket of CO two. Right. And yep. you're not and generating enough turbulence to move that out. So yeah, it just sits there unless you happen to fan it. I, yeah, I've learned that the hard way. To to really get the nice grow, you do need to have that those side holes pretty dialed in with the. With and it's the, the same with the pans. That's why I like to use those three inch deep trays um, for the same right. reason. If you're using shoe boxes inside the, the put shoe boxes inside the very same tent I use, you're gonna notice a dramatic decrease in the you know how good the mushrooms look they're going to look much more noodly and you're not going to get as good of a pin set th oh. because air gets trapped right and yeah so then they because they get to the point in their growing cycle where they go oh we should start growing now but then they're like holy shit there's way too much co2 we thought we would should have more fresh air by now and now they're just like shooting up like little rockets right yep and they stay yeah. super skinny and they look like noodles Right, and they're fun to harvest, though, right? Oh yeah, <laughs> oh yeah, super fun. So well, I had that's cool. I still, like man, <laughs> I still can't get over how you like how many grows. Because you weren't. It isn't like how fucking spoiled we are now, where we just have all these resources and all these places to go to learn about this. I mean, were you just doing a crazy amount of trial and error, or did somebody give you some? indication of like oh well you can't do that or you should try this i failed for eight months straight when i, I first did it with pans um and i did have people i was talking to that you know gave me their two cents and some of it was helpful some of it wasn't um the uh there was a couple a couple of key things that i had to figure out and they're, they're, they're the main things i hit on in my class first of all you have to have healthy spawn if, if you're going you know right agar to spawn to bulk your spawn has to be healthy and pans are much less resistant to any type of bacterial presence mm. so the hydration of your grain has a much smaller window of where your culture is going to be happy so if your grain oh. is a little too wet bacteria is going to multiply and the pan like tubes will push right gotcha. through it your mycelium might be a little thicker right. you might get you know that marshmallow that type can grow yeah. but they'll still grow mushrooms for you right pans are gonna stall out they're either gonna just stop growing all together until the grain gets slimy or they um well it'll grow super thick and never even start to colonize your substrate i see so um, yeah they're they're less forgiving you you got to be a little more dialed absolutely and yeah. so figuring out the the right uh, amount of water in your grain was crucial and that's why i i uh use the 75 percent millet and 25 percent rye berries it's just easier for me to hit that window using primarily millet because it doesn't hold a whole bunch of water and right and I you're just getting a little touch of that water from your rye berries then not right that yeah makes the sense. rye berries act like little hydration pockets so i gotcha. kind of i started with all millet and then just kept adding a little bit of rye berry to it until gotcha. i was where i wanted to be and I, the, the all millet kept coming back too dry it would stall out and run out of moisture before full colonization so i added a little bit of rye and a little bit more until i got to 
you know, where they were fully colonizing with no bacteria, and that's right. kind of where I've just held it at. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, I, I do the same thing just for cubes. I really like running 50-50 oats and millet for the same reason. I get more inoculation points, but then I get the water from the, more water from the oats, so that, that makes sense. Hey, but I now, use oats, and the oats worked great several times, and then I got a bag of oats, and I everything except for the gourmets was failing, oh, okay. and uh, I couldn't figure out why. And it, I like that, the whole that whole bag of oats, everything except for oysters, pretty much. Mm. I think cubes did okay. I, I wasn't running a whole bunch of cubes at the time, but yeah, all the I've exotic, noticed. I think oats are dirtier. I think they're yeah. harder to get them clean. And some some bags like some some bags that you get have. I guess more endospores and they're yeah. just dirtier than others. Just dirtier. But it happened to me like two or three times where I would get a bag of oats and it would have been working fine before. And then all of a sudden I had several PC runs where everything failed. Right. So I uh, ditched oats and switched it, swapped it out with rye berries instead. And that stopped happening. So problem solved. Nice. Yeah, I don't know what it is about that. Now, I don't even know, like, what the fuck people do with rye berries if they're not making mushrooms. I don't know if it's just cleaner. You know, like, I like popcorn for cubes because it's clean. Um, I, I wonder if rye berries are just unnaturally cleaner, um, you know. When I get, the, I, I get the rye berries from an uh, uh, organic market, like a co-op. Mm -hmm. And they know exactly why I'm buying rye berries. Oh. Every, every single time I get them, there's some hippie behind yeah. the counter like, "What's up? <laughs> What's up, dude? <laughs> oh, you don't have your wallet today. That's fine. We can we can figure something out." <laughs> right. That's funny. Man, now my, my feed store, they wouldn't know what the hell's going on. They're so clueless. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's like where I get the manure from is a, uh, a horse feed store. That's where I get the, the manure and the millet. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, went, I went, we'll go over the manure later, but I, I went through a process of where I would come back and I would be like, this manure is no good. And they're like, what do you mean? I'd be like, it, it's, it's not working for me. Like, where did you, how is it different? And what I found was sometimes they would go to one farm that the cows were grass fed and the other farm they were mostly fed like they were fed uh, corn and other grains oh. and that made wow. a difference and then they had a uh, you know manure compost that had a uh, it wasn't it wasn't uh, aged and it had like mulch and and no. dirt in it and that didn't work out so it wasn't like properly field aged Right, and it had a bunch yeah. of other stuff in it. They figured you're using it for composting, so right, sticks so and dirt gosh. won't hurt anything. Right, and uh, so I think they kind of they they, they kind of figured out along the lines what I was doing. I think uh, um, yeah, they, you know they don't care. Yeah, but and and they, they of course it. don't know exactly what kind of you know. And there's lots of different kinds of mushrooms, but I was so picky about my manure. They were kind of <laughs> they were kind of like well. What is it that you're looking for? I mean, they, right. once I told them and they, I dialed it in, they were happy to oblige. So now, yeah. whenever I need something, they'll deliver my own dump truck of it. <laughs> yeah, so I, I forget who I was talking to. Uh, I think it was in Discord. Somebody was like, oh, yeah, you know, uh, they got nosy. They wanted to know what I was doing. And I was like, dude, just look, think about it. They're, you're at a feed store and you're coming in asking them weird ass questions that farmers don't normally ask them. They're just thinking, what are you doing with this? Yeah, like uh, you don't gotta get mad at them. Just you know, I just tell them I'm growing. I tell them I'm growing mushrooms, and they don't even ask me what kind. They don't give a shit. Oh, okay, cool. You're doing something different with it. Great. Now I know you're not weird. Right. Well, you you're, you not, you're not rubbing it on yourself. Or... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, you just made me think. I wonder if fucking weirdos <laughs> do that shit. Like, oh, here comes the guy that buys poop in a bag for the wrong reasons. <laughs> oh my god. I guess the I guess the thing there could they could be getting nosy is I mean you can make fertilizer bombs. So oh, yeah. Yeah, maybe true. maybe that could be what they're getting at when they're like, What what are you what are you that so could be. for? Yeah. That could be. They uh anyway, my my place they're so nice and man I can get millet for forty bucks for a fifty pound bag and 
Um, yeah. I don't grow that much anyway, so that should last me. A Which long is time. crazy. Just a couple of years ago, I was getting millet for eighteen bucks. A fifty-pound oh bag God. was eighteen bucks. Now, like it's you said, it's, it's in the forty. Yeah. Rye berries have pretty much. If they were at sixty dollars, now they're up to almost eighty. Jesus. But yeah, grain prices have gone up. Oats too. Oats, yeah. I don't get them anymore. But oats were only like fourteen dollars a bag or something, and now they're. 30 couple beginning of the year i got them for 11 bucks and yeah it's up to 18 now well that's still not but i'm not nearly it's not bad. too bad here <laughs> yeah we're, we're by amish country though so we probably get a little discount around here for some reason there you go yeah, yeah no, the, the the manure i get a pretty good deal on but now, the green the green can hurt sometimes now you just said when you're talking about manure for some reason it just triggered this thought. So you do this this heat cycle, right? This this like uh, evaporation cycle in in your tent. And I'm thinking the way these things grow naturally is on cow patties, right? Yep. So the cow shits out this big cow patty. It's steaming hot, right? It's just steaming hot, and it's sitting on the ground. It starts to evaporate a little bit, and then it cools off at night. And then in the morning, the morning dew moisturizes it. You know, moisturizes it a little bit. And, uh, and then the sun dries it off again. You're really, I, I bet you're just recreating that process that it's used to going through sitting on that cow patty in, in some fucking field. Exactly. And like, you know, the, 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 in the morning the grass gets wet and it's down yep. in the grass and then it dries yep. out. And then... Yeah, you're just duplicating that. It, it pays to think, and I bring this up because I hear a lot of people saying, oh, I'm going to grow this i'm gonna grow that and i'm just like you yeah, know people haven't grown that one yet good luck um but you know i think the more you think about how it occurs in nature um i mean that's where you got to start you got to go well exactly what's going on out in the wild how do i artificially recreate that yeah it, well and with a lot of the the more difficult exotics the biggest thing i found to help me there is uh, putting grass in your casing. Planting grass oh. into your casing for whatever reason helps your helps keep your casing from contaminating. So like just like, wheat grass. Yeah, I mean it just uh I mean I don't even know, it's just regular old grass. I don't oh, just grass that, seed. I don't know if, that it matters what kind, but yeah, it just you don't have spot, uh, spots of trick forming, all, all you know, because a lot of them move really slowly, and you're, they're going to be right. in fruiting conditions for at least a month or two before you start to get fruits. And if you don't, if you just have a regular casing on there, more likely than not, you're going to get trick or a container. So, but now I've surface. never, I've never seen this. I, I've seen an occasional sprout. I've never seen what is how you're describing. Like just literally a, a sheet of, I'm assuming thin, you know, grass sprouts. That then ultimately. Can I can I upload a picture? Is that possible? Yeah, you can. Um, you would go under uh, present. There's a feed. Uh, or there's somewhere I I've not seen the the app or how it works on the phone, but um, at the bottom there should be a present icon. You click on that. And then you go to slides, or no, you would go to share screen, and, and then, you know, once you pull it up in another window, you could share it that It says, screen. mic, cam, chat, more, and leave. And under more, I have comments and settings. Oh, maybe you can't on... Well, if yeah. you know how to do it, I can send it... Oh, yeah, dude, just email it uh, here. I'm going to... Um... Yeah, just, uh, it's mycogeeky at protonmail.com. Yeah, just send it to me. I'll pull it up, and then we can look at it. I would love to see this. I'm sure everybody else would. Because you're talking about something I don't think I've really ever heard anybody mention is the idea that adding some grass layer, which is very natural, it's, right? It's how mushrooms grow anyway. But adding that to your casing layer as a way of decreasing contamination is... Interesting. All 
All right, guys, we're, we're waiting for him. I think he's just trying to figure that out. In the meantime, for those of you who haven't seen some of uh, Jake's stuff, let's pull it up. This guy's packing tubs with pan cyans all day long. Look at that. He's got his Red Bull sitting on top of there. All sorts of good... Uh, so maybe this is what he was... To, I see a little fuzzy feet on these ones, too. Where uh, they, I guess... Oh, yeah, and that's because he doesn't have the holes lower. Look at that. Okay, check out your uh, your Facebook Messenger. I sent it over oh, there. Oh, great. Okay, perfect. Oh, yeah, I got it. Okay, hold on. Let me download it. Download it. Now I got to convert it, of course. Hold on. On the fly. Let's do this. I can find it. Here we go. I gotta convert it to a PDF. Sorry, guys, this is probably super boring, but it'll be worth it. We're gonna get to see uh, grassy mushrooms. So yeah, these were actually mislabeled. I was I got them under they they were labeled as papuna, and I grew them out, and they definitely were not. And Alan uh, actually came and stayed with me for a week around this time. So we uh, did microscopic and PCR analysis, and they came back in section Zapotec Corum, and okay. they're a relative of Subtropicalis. All right, here we go. I'm close. Uploading now. Bam. All right, that didn't take long. Yeah, that, like that. that is a trippy sight right there. So th these are just pan cyans, or is this something different? No, this these were when I got them, they were labeled as papuna. Oh, oh, sorry. I, they, see, I wasn't listening to you because I'm like doing. I was trying to look all this up. It's okay. But yeah, no, Alan uh, actually ended up staying with me around this time, and we did a PCR analysis on them, and they came back in section Zapotectorum. And okay. they're uh, a relative uh, of Subtropicalis. Nice. Okay. Yeah. So now, where did you get these spores? Um, someone gifted them to me off okay. of Shroomery. And, and um, you thought they were pans, though? No, I thought they were uh, psilocybe papuna. Oh, pa okay. That's what sorry. they were labeled okay, as. I finally get it. <laughs> okay, but but he's saying they're they're more likely zaps or closely related or uh, so. Well, they're us. they're in section Zapotec Corum, so it gets kind of right. Z Zapotec Corum and section Zapotec Corum are, are different, but oh, they're okay. they're most closely related to subtropicalis, psilocybe subtropicalis. Okay, I'm but uh, so now what? So is this a new thing you're doing lately? The, the um, no, not lately. I uh, recently had to move my lab and all my stuff. So when I uh, where I was at before, I had my pans dialed in and I uh, everything was good with them. So I started experimenting with uh, other exotics. Like I built a, a cold uh, fruiting chamber and I had ovioids in there. And okay. I started to get some pins on the ovioids and the alini. And I had some Liberty Cap trays. Um, and then the uh, compressor gave out because it was an old fridge I had converted. Mm. And it was the middle of summer and the compressor gave out and everything died. And, it, and I ended up having to move my lab twice. You just got to you just got to come up to northern Ohio and you can conduct all the uh, all the cold <laughs> cold weather stuff you want. We, we yeah. can do that. Yeah, that's uh, that is dude. I'm sorry. I'm just still kind of in awe of seeing that because i don't know why but personally um the more artificial i grow mushrooms the more i'm like i would love to be i want to i want these outdoor beds it's like i want to do it outdoors i want to i want to have a garden of mushrooms like oh here's my ovids here's my this here's my that <laughs> 
Yeah, that, that, that's the, the dream. Although I probably live in the worst place to do that. I, I, I got it depends on what you're trying to grow. So like True. I have I have a couple uh Azzy and uh Subergosia patches and I planted them up on the mountain near where I am and I'm starting to realize that even though it's a little cooler up there, mm -hmm. that because of the 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 angle of the mountain and how steep it is, it doesn't hold a bunch of moisture up there. So yeah. It seems like the ground stays too dry for them to really be happy. So I'm on year two, and I'm still, I got fingers crossed that I'm going to get some fruits come up for, um, in them uh, here in the next couple weeks. But I, uh, I'm going to make some new patches down in the valley where the walk, where it'll okay. stay a little wetter for them. Because, yeah, every time I go, even like a day after it rains, the ground is just dry. And I think wow. it's just because yeah. all the water just runs down off the mountain. Gravity, dude. Yeah, damn gravity. Just fucking <laughs> constantly, never goes away. Always got to deal with it. So annoying. I hate it. All right, so let's. So this uh, this is cool. Uh, hold on, let me. I, even I could look at this grass picture all day, but uh, <laughs> let me pull this off. Um, okay, so let's go back. Uh, I remember the first time I read uh, Jack Tech. Um, I thought it was interesting. Now, at the time when I first read it, I had not ever seen pan cyan mycelium on a plate. But in getting ready for the podcast, I was looking at it again going, oh, yeah, the one time I grew it, it just looked like kind of wimpy, wispy little mycelium. And uh, you talk a little bit about when you're germinating spores, what to look for, how to isolate, all that. You want to talk a little bit about what your thought process is when you're doing that. Yeah, it's funny. I've had a couple people in the class that when we go over you know, the, the optimal mycelium, they'll be like, oh, man, I thought that those were no good. I threw out a bunch of dishes that they looked just like that. Ones. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, that really just comes with, it, you know, experience, like right. putting different, you know, you get different dishes and putting them to grain and uh, keeping track of which ones perform well and which ones keeping don't. Keeping track, yes. So I, I, all my dishes will have different T number labels. So mm -hmm. I'll have T1, T2, T3, um, and that's from uh, different transfers out of the uh, the multi-spore dish. And uh, I figured out pretty quickly that the faster it moves, and the the mostly the faster it moves, but usually it's the more wispy, uh, light looking growths. Right. that did the best and then whenever you get a really thick growth it would either stall or overlay right um which is so kind that's, of that's fascinating to think about that because that's a different that's a different criteria than i've ever used for cubes for cubes you know i mean i i can toss any plate i'm gonna get fruit right but of course Everybody wants rhizo, rhizomorphic growth, because it's going to colonize my cake faster, less likely for contams. Um, but now you're saying just speed and wispiness. So like speed above all, almost not, you're not, it doesn't need to be pretty, basically. Right. And I mean, right. yeah, it's never going to look like, you know, people have those uh, rizzo, uh, uh, rizzo growth on colored agar and it looks you know, super pretty. You're you're never gonna have uh, pans that look that pretty. Um, I mean, they're pretty in their own way, but <laughs> they uh, right. yeah. They're, you're, you're mostly looking for what moves the fastest. Okay. Um, and the faster it colonizes the dish, your spawn and your uh, your your substrate, the less chance contamination has to get a foothold in and. Uh, yeah, pans really like moving on a, a schedule. It's not like with cubes where your jars are fully colonized and you're about to go on vacation so you can just let them chill Sit for on a them week for or a while. so. Right. Yeah, pans the, they do not appreciate that. Their right. yield will definitely suffer when you finally get them uh, into the fruiting. So just less forgiving, more uh, really scheduled. Yeah, as soon as as soon as your dish is ready to is fully colonized and ready to use, get it to grain. As soon as your grain is fully colonized, get it to bulk. 
once your bulk gotcha. is fully colonized, case it and then get it in fruiting. And then, you know, don't let it dry out. Um, and, and you're good. Now, sometimes you'll still get, you'll it, it, like when going for multi-spore, you'll still get cultures that just don't fruit well. You can do everything right and everything can look good and it just no. doesn't want to send up mushrooms. Right. Um, but that's why when you get ones that do work well, you want to duplicate and transfer. And uh, eventually you'll build up a library of uh, stuff that is going gonna, gonna to work well for you. And that just takes time, energy, and patience, yep. Yep. Well, and, and hitting, so like we talked about the, the moisture content of your spawn, that, that's a, a big, a, a big uh, piece of the puzzle that I feel like a lot of people get hung up on there. The other one would be like uh, we were talking about uh, selecting the wrong growth. People are looking for the really thick, the really thick growth on agar and they're just shooting themselves in the foot out the gate. And then uh, the, the same with bulk, having your, your bulk, if, if, you're, if it's too wet, you're just going to smother your culture out. So right. that's why I like to put a good bit of uh, chopped straw in my substrate because it helps keep the substrate nice and fluffy. Because um, if you're using wet, dense manure, it's just that the, the, the mycelium is never going to really get established well like inside. Like you might get a right. thin layer of colonization across the surface, but then you have a big wet, dense yeah, mess it, underneath it. And the, you know, the, the pan mycelium, it's similar to the fruits, right? They're more delicate. Yep. You know, the fruits are more delicate, the mycelium is more delicate. So, yeah, you can't just, like, squash, especially with some smeary-ass poo sub. You can't just smash all that shit down and it'll just be, you know, like, there's no aerobic activity going on. It's just pure gunk. Exactly. Yeah. So that, 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 that heavy amount of chopped straw. And that was Ouch. one of the, that was one of the key, uh, the, the key things that I figured out for when I finally started having success was... I was reading a bunch of stuff and people were saying the the more the more poo that you have in there, the better your yield is gonna be. And mm -hmm. it actually is almost the opposite. I don't wanna yeah. say having no poo is the best, that's not the case, but right. um it's definitely more important that the the substrate is fluffy and aerated right. than maximizing the amount of poo you're getting to be the substrate. Yeah, uh, uh, Slightly Feral was on last week, one of my buddies, and he was talking about, he goes, so imagine this little straw in your substrate. And he's like, you know, so it's like a piece this long, and on one end the mite goes in it, and he's like, and then it can just travel through the inside of that straw, and then now it's got a whole new inoculation point, you know, yeah. on the other side of the bag. Which I'd never even thought about that either, but that all goes into, you know, it's more aerated because... The poo and the other stuff, it's not crammed inside the straw. So it's like natural aeration tubes inside there, too. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and, and even uh, Wumbo Maiko was talking about he likes putting straw even on his cute his cube cakes for, for the same, you know, I, I, I don't know why the fuck I'm not trying the straw. It's probably good. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, when I was when I was uh, in Colorado doing this, you know, I just used nothing but straw. It was just straw logs inoculated with rye berries, and um, yeah. wow. it, it worked pretty well. I still think that for cubes, cocoa core is just so easy. Yeah, um, I, I I don't know. I I don't spend a whole lot of time messing with them anymore, and it's nice to just be able to, you know, get it done as a side note on everything right. else I'm working for, and everything turn out perfectly. Right. Um, but now, I got yeah, straw definitely works works great for them. Quick question while we're talking about straw and poo and all that. Uh, Tommy Fan wants to know, can you ask him, uh, can we use worm, I think he means worm castings instead of horse poo. Have you ever tried to not use the the field age manure? Um, yeah, so I did a couple attempts actually trying to use cocoa core and uh, it colonized fine but then i just never got fruits um, none of the pans came up um the 
Tampanescence and Mexicana, they do great on Coco Core. Mm -hmm. Subtropicalis does great on Coco Core. The thing about Subtropicalis is it moves a little bit slow. Um, okay. So you have to do a good job of keeping your fruiting chamber really clean so that it can right. make it through until it comes the fruit. Right. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you just got you just got to keep you it clean. You can do for, it, buddy. Oh no, weeks. tricks on the way. Oh <laughs> shit. Yeah. But um I've I seen know. other people have made uh have done grows where it was no manure, just straw and they did get fruits. It wasn't oh. a full canopy or anything. Mm -hmm. Um but I I don't I, I don't think that it's really prudent. I mean, unless you just want to do it to say you can do it. Right. Um but the manure really, really seems to help things work out the best for you. And that, like I said, it doesn't have to be majorly manure. I mean, you can have right. mostly straw with some manure in there just for, you know, water retention. But um, I've never tried just worm castings. Somebody gets to fuck around and find out, I think. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah. it seems like worm castings are pretty dense. Like when when it gets wet, it yeah, really pretty yeah, dense, they're pretty pretty soppy. Mm -hmm. As long as you have plenty of straw, uh, it, it might work. Yeah, the um, I just in my head I just go okay. So if I look up uh, pan cyans and it says oh they're distributed in these you know tropical and subtropical locations and they grow on cow manure. That's what they grow on. So I, I would never think to not do that, but uh, poo doesn't smell good. So I'm sure people are just thinking, how can we do this, you know, with what we already use? That's probably what most people are thinking. But it seems like I, I don't, anybody with a proven tech on these and who are succeeding seem to be using a component of, of manure for this. All right, where'd he go? You there? Uh-oh, guys. We lost Jake. Hopefully he comes back. Yeah, you hear me? Sorry, I, oh, sent, you okay. another, I sent you another picture. And oh, message. cool. Okay, Audio me... cut out when I do that. All right, let me... Uh, I'll get this one down here pretty fast. Now that I know what I'm doing. Two seconds. One, two, sorry, maybe more than two seconds. But yeah, but this will show the, the difference that, you know, in the types of poo. So it's like some people will get black cow manure um, that they sell at like garden, garden uh, stores. Right. And it's super dense. It almost smells like diesel. And, and, and uh, uh, surely not actually field aged. Absolutely not. Yeah. But it, and it's just it's just too dense. Um, yeah. But the the properly aged uh, manure, it almost like when you turn it with a shovel, it almost looks like ash in the middle. Like it'll be light that. brown and gray. Very different, and I, I imagine less smelly because yeah. all the smells just from the bacteria. So field aged should. That should be gone. Yeah, it really only smells uh, right after you take it out of pasteurization, right. like you know, when it's wet and hot. But right. once it's colonized, it doesn't smell at all. Nice. Cool. So, so we did agar. We've talked about grain, and your so your the agar you you want fast. So when I'm if I get spores, I'm just looking and say a streak of plate. And I get little colonies popping up. I after they get going a little bit, I just want the biggest colony. Take from that. Hope that's that's my guy. If, and if it is nice and wispy, send it. See what happens. Yeah, I would take a couple of them and label each okay. one. Label it transfer one, two, and three. Um, so when going for multi spore with pans, about fifteen to twenty percent of cultures will mm -hmm. stall. I, I call it the, the shake test. So when okay. it goes to grain at about 25-30% colonization when you shake it, right. it'll some of them will just stall out. 
So if you have transfers one through three and transfer two stalls on the shake test, just go back to your agar and remove the T2 plates. Gotcha. Um, and then you don't have to waste more material on it. Right. That is good. Yeah, the shake, I, I, I never I never even thought of that the shake. For me, my, my shake tech shake test is really at a hundred percent i shake at 30 and 100 and then if it doesn't really fucking bounce back fast i you know and and i don't have room i usually don't send it but i i never have heard and this is interesting that at your 30 percent shake you get something that you know just oh nope it doesn't like it didn't like being disturbed it must have been really not not tough enough yeah, yeah, no, usually when they bounce back from the, if they bounce back from the 30, if it pans, I never shake them again. After, after that okay. first shake, they move so fast that the next time, you know, they bounce back, they've right. pretty much taken over the jar. Ready and to go. Just a couple more days until it's fully colonized and then go to, go to bulk. Nice. So then, uh, so for sub, you're saying you're doing 75% straw, 25 or 65% straw, 35% manure, and do you put anything else in it? Uh, vermiculite. Oh, so, vermiculite, okay. Like 5 five to 10% vermiculite. Okay. Um, and I don't, honestly, I don't know exactly why I do that. I've always just added a little bit of vermiculite. Mm -hmm. It very well could not be needed. Um, vermiculite is like the pepper of the mycology <laughs> yeah. world. You just, you put pepper on everything. Yeah, yeah. It, yes. it's definitely not hurting anything. And yeah. I got, you know, it's not super expensive and you only need a little bit. So right. I just, I, mean, I haven't bothered doing it without to see if it's going to work because I don't want to find out that it <laughs> makes some difference and right. then I've wasted something. So Now, have you ever tried um, other field aged manure, not from cows? Yeah, so... Well, like I was saying, when I got um, they, I got a load in from that other farm. Well, it was still from cows, but they were grain and corn fed. Right, right. And it uh, made a huge difference. I mean, I still got growth, but I I didn't hit any any canopy trays with it. And uh, you know, so the, grass fed is superior. Absolutely, right. and I, I I can't say exactly why. But mm -hmm. yeah, every time I put the uh, the grain the grain fed manure down, I would only get fruits along the edges of the trays, and uh, you know just a couple little right. clusters, and they never really got big. They pretty much pinned, and then the pins might get a little fatter. Okay. But um, so there know, has to be some nutrition profile in in those grass fed in that grass-fed manure that, that just jives with the biochemistry of, of the pan science. It's just got to, just yeah, it's, where it feels it, good. It's either that or there's something in the grain that they were feeding the cows that uh, right. <laughs> feels right. wrong. That's but, true. That's true. Um, I, yeah, I think it's probably the former. I say that because I have some neighbors that have tortoises, and they have a giant pile of dung, and I always joke to them and say, I'm going to have to come, come over and get some of that. And they're always like, what do you want that for? And I'm like, oh, I'm going to use it as fertilizer. And they're like, oh, <laughs> you can come over and take it. Um, but, but I think they feed them more like vegetables, and I don't think they're eating quite the same diet as a cow. Well, and don't, don't reptiles, it, it, it does, do they poo and pee separately? Is it like birds or... <laughs> I don't, I don't even know, man. <laughs> I've heard know, elephant. Madam. Elephant has worked fine. I've heard elephant rhino working out. Well, shit, uh, that's easy. All I gotta do is get a couple <laughs> elephants and I'm in business. Alpaca, Simple. I've heard not work out. Um, okay. And then Won't horse. Horse will work. Um, and I, I've tried using horse, and uh, it, it just it doesn't work as well. And I mean, there could be other factors playing into it, but. Right. Uh, the cow definitely seems to be uh, the best. <laughs> All right, here we go. Ed Grand's got a theory. He said, do you think grain-fed feedlot cows could have a lot of antibiotics in their feed? That's also... That, that's what thought. I was thinking with, with, with when I said there was other things that in the right. feed or that they were given. Um, it very yeah, well... it's hurting it, yeah. 
That makes sense. Cool, man. So, um, so we did agar, we did grain, we did sub. Um, now, if you're like me and many other people, I can do all the research, and uh, I can think I know what I'm doing, and then I go to do it, and I still make 50 mistakes. But I know that you have uh, a weekend class that really guides people through the process much more meticulously, and you also do uh, consult, right? So like if I wanted to grow and I was getting ready to do a grow, I could hire you to consult with and just get detailed, this is exactly what you do, and, and really kind of walk me through the process. Do you, are you still doing that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay, yeah, cool. the consults are more for if you're having some success and you want to fine-tune it, um, right, but right. you kind of already have your, your, your setup going and you, you want me to uh, help you tweak it and make it better for you, then those are good. If you've never done them before and you're starting from scratch, then I recommend Do the class, class. Okay, just cool. so you don't you know, buy a bunch of stuff you don't right. need. Like I've had several people you know, order inkjet or uh, ink birds and uh, what were the, the, the order like other kits from like uh, Etsy and Amazon. Right. And I have to tell them like, yeah, you're not going to need any of that. <laughs> you need this instead. And right, I mean, there, there's more than one way to skin a cat for sure. But I, um, you know, I haven't grown every, you know, I haven't tried every method there is to grow them. So some some of them I right. just you know I'm gonna tell you you know try it and tell me how it goes. You're you're like well, <laughs> you keep wanting to do whatever the fuck you want to do, so why don't you just do it and then tell me what happens? Yeah. Uh, well, just a quick shout out. I like to do these shout outs when people uh, have positive experiences. Uh, Jake just said I did a consult with Jake and it was worth every penny. Phenomenal teacher. Uh, got one from Jason Blackburn. Take the class. Definitely worth the time and money. Get the frame of reference to grow from. Uh, so that's great feedback to hear. Awesome. Um, we also, Alan and I are doing a breeding and genetics class on January 5th. Oh. Um, so, yeah, we'll go over uh, forced hybridization, um, uh, traditional breeding methods, uh phenotype selection. Alan's going to go over some uh, microscopic stuff. Alan is a wizard with the microscope. He and, definitely uh, is a wizard, yes. <laughs> being able to identify, um, you know, your your monokaryotic cultures right. uh, through serial dilution, um, uh, being able to um, identify hyphal, hyphal clamp formation so that you know you've actually bred the two different monokaryotic cultures. Right. Um, so yeah, no, I'm really excited about that. That would be um, great. Now, when is it? You said January 5th? Yeah. It, it, well, originally I was looking for dates with Alan and, you know, Alan's pretty busy. So uh, we were going oh, through... oh, we know that around here. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we know. So we were going through dates in, uh, in December and he just kept saying, no, I can't do that date. Can't do yeah. that date. And I was like, well, December 31st. And he was like, all right. And I was so excited to have found a date, I just wasn't even thinking that it was New Year's Eve. Right, right, right. But then after that. the fact, we went back and we changed it to January 5th. Uh, Dude, but for so. him, that might be the day you need to get him. <laughs> it might <laughs> right. be the, the day when no one else will go foraging with him is the day <laughs> you get him. Exactly. Yeah. The only thing that's going on is parties, and Alan's got no mushroom conferences or anything. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it's available. Dude, he hears the call. <laughs> he hears the call, and if he hears the call, that's it. That's how it is. I mean, that's why we love him. He's uh, one of a kind, for sure. Uh, that is a that's cool that you're doing that class, and you do that through what is the site called? Something about coffee, right? Buy me coffee. Yeah, buy me. A, well, that's where you sign up. Everything, okay. all the classes I do is on uh, Discord. Like Discord, oh, cool. okay. is really awesome for it. I used to do a combination of Discord and Ring Central. And the girl that was helping me set it up that way so that the audio was through Ring Central and then the videos and pictures were on Discord. I see. And then when we stopped working together, I was just like, why don't I just do the phone call on Discord? Right, and just do it there. Everything, everything went so much smoother because you only have one thing open. So, yeah, I just do the whole thing on Discord. Nice. That works pretty well. That's great. So, uh, so January 5th, you're doing that. Um, and then I believe you told me every last Saturday of the month is when you do your, is it a two or three day class? 
It's a three-hour class. Three-hour um, class. Sorry, three-day. De okay. De de depending on the amount of uh, sign up. So right. usually there's you – know, I have like four or five people signed up, and three hours is what it takes. Uh, like this last – this last class i had just one person in there and we actually moved it to the following week um so it was basically just an extended consultation nice. and we got it done in about two hours two two hours and 20 minutes um Very cool. but yeah with, with several people usually by the time everyone gets their questions in and we've gone through and made sure everyone's got a handle on everything it's about three hours right now i vaguely recall at one point Nicky Michael was selling your substrate. Is he still doing that? Like some yeah, he sort still of substrate. Has, he still has the substrate listed. Um, I've started doing the, the like the selling the substrate directly through Buy Me a Coffee now. Also, um, it also used okay. to be on Inoculate the World, but a lot of the vendor sites they run into issues selling spores and substrate. So they have to be careful about selling both. They have so, to sell one or the other, really? I didn't know that. Yeah, that well, that's... Uh, they can't be an all-in-one shop. Right, that's because illegal. then you have a hard time selling the spores for microscopic use when you're selling oh, substrate I see. right next to okay, it. Okay, okay. And that's why I used to be able to offer uh, spores with the class, and mm -hmm. for the same reason, I, uh, I can't do that. So now, gotcha. if you separately want to look at spores under a microscope <laughs> that's what i do you see that's that's it's right there guys all i do i look at them and i go oh my god i'm gonna measure the fuck out of you spores. <laughs> that measure right you. There i'm gonna compare you to spore. other spores and then i'm gonna get an average size for you i'm gonna notate your color i feel some people i feel like they just they, they collect them like pokemon cards like Man, I'm telling you, yeah, some of these Reddit kids, uh, I'm, I've talked to people, they're like, I have 200 unique varieties. And I'm like, cool, man, how long have you been grown for? Oh, I haven't grown anything yet. <laughs> what? You got the weirdest hobby I have ever heard of, man. You should, like, man, fucking collect salt and pepper shakers if you want to do something weird. Yeah, and hey, the, the, one day they'll be ready if they, want, if they ever decide to pull the trigger, they will, they'll have a lifetime supply of spores to work with. Well, a lot of the exotics, especially like Mexicana and Tampanescence, they're only going to keep for about a year or so. Like I have to, oh, really? I have to oh. go and reload on a lot of my exotics from Alan. Um, I, Alan, a lot of the real, the real exotic ones, he sends me gill fragments. And okay. uh, you know, a lot of them, I came back to them you know, after I moved my labs and everything. About 18 months went by. And most of the, the, real, the ultra rare ones, are gone like they, they really oh for see man i made the assumption because i had read stories of spores you know uh you know 50 years 10 years 20 years so i just assumed they all would just last years and years and years you yeah, know the, the cubes uh, and uh the wood lovers last pr pretty much indefinitely like i have wow. the first azzy print that i that i i kept from all the way back to hippie dan and right. it, it still will germinate. And then cubes, I, I don't think I've ever lost the print of cubes. Um, and Rich nice. sent me some uh, some 20-year-old prints um, for, of like the, the, the real old-school uh, cube strains, like the KOH and uh, right. a couple other ones. And, and they germinated fine. But then, yeah, Mexicana, Tampanescence, Neopensis, all mm. those all those odd ones um a year or two and i gotta find another print interesting I, that almost feels like a research project like what what is it about them i wonder uh, maybe they're just more fragile because the, they are their morphology seems a little less rugged i don't know yeah. i've never i've never encountered a z zap so i don't know but a lot of the other you know, delicate ones are, they're just obviously not as robust and hardy yeah. as, as a cube is. Maybe it's just tied to the, that. The Neopensis is extremely, extremely delicate. Mm. I, I did a couple attempts with that one, and that was right around the time I started to move, so there were some interruptions, but yeah, they were, they are extremely finicky. You make oh. one mistake during their cultivation, and they're like, nope, we're out. No chance. <laughs> you had your chance, and you blew it. Uh, 
man, that is, now I'm like, I'm like, damn, I just got some shit from, uh, Jordan Jacobs, and I'm like, fuck, I gotta go, now I gotta get these on a plate, I've been sitting on them, got me worried now. I mean, I was also moving, so, I don't, you know, like, them being moved from one place to another, and then the back of the car, and getting yeah, hot, there could have been other factors there that, you know, worked against me, Right. but, um... I tried to be pretty good about making sure my spore binder, because I have, it's basically like a, a card collection binder right. to put baseball cards in. Mm -hmm. And uh, I try and keep that in a cool, cool, dry place most of the time. But yeah, I, uh, I lost a bunch of stuff throughout that process, just not working with them. Um, and some of them I was able to hydrate and bring back, but not most of them. Yeah, I wonder if you, you know, you swab a print, you put the swab in some sterile water for I don't know how long and and then see what see what you can get out of it. Maybe that helps. Yeah, well that that's what I I put them uh, I got a whole bunch of centrifuges left over from uh mm -hmm. the the cause when Alan came over we did a bunch of stuff with PCR. I actually bought a PCR uh, machine from them that uh, you know, runs through the different temperature and times, and I, I got a whole bunch of centrifuges, and yeah. I got um, pipettes, and all kinds of fun stuff. So you're, you're doing the thermocycling, you're doing, you're do, you bought it, did you buy the little mini PCR? No, he, I, I got a, a full-sized one from Alan, it was his oh, old nice. one. <laughs> oh, very cool. And then I, I got a, uh, a instructed, instructor course from him and awesome. Everything. Um, we did a couple of videos at the time. I know I got everything I needed for uh, electro uh, electrophoresis, and uh, he had made his own little UV light thing with it, and that was really cool learning how to do all that. And then I ordered all the uh, the, pro the master mix and the primers I need from the Odin. Gotcha. Yeah, man. All the cool kids are doing the, the PCR, man. It's fun. I think it'll be good. I think as uh, it seems like the interest in other psilocybe species are, are, are growing and uh, the, the pans, the zaps, the, the all sorts of wild stuff. People, you know, the, we're getting bougie. It's, you know, like if you go to Portland and you buy a steak, right, you want to know, uh, you know the name of the, you know, where was this cow from? What field did he graze on? Right, like we want to know, we want the whole story. So, uh, I think I, I, you know a lot of people they want to they want to pioneer something new. True. Yes. Uh oh, we lost uh, again. I, oh, you did? Yeah, you're back though. Okay. I said uh, a lot of people want to pioneer something new and kind of you know stake their claim. It's really hard to do that with cubes. Yeah. When they're just they're so figured out and they've been around for so long now. Correct. And I think it's good. I mean, I. Honestly, I feel there's a very there's a very big difference in the effects, like between pan, pans and cubensis. I won't I won't even eat cubes anymore. Cubes tend to give me first of all a stomach ache, and then they uh -huh. come with waves of anxiety. And pans uh -huh. pans don't are extremely energetic. Yeah, I'm losing you again. Oh, you are? Yeah. Oh, it's my finger. <laughs> when uh, I hope that they have the mic right at the base of my phone. Of course. So like, when I hold my phone, my a phone. different way. Oh, okay. Um, but yeah, no, the pans are much more energetic, and they don't they don't bother my stomach at all. And they, uh, I, I'll get these intense waves of euphoria on them that I would I never got from cubes, and I don't know nice. if it's just the difference in. Uh, psilocybin and psilocybin ratios. Mm -hmm. Pans are also the only mushroom that produce serotonin, although supposedly uh, your body is not able to absorb the serotonin or it can't get past the blood-brain barrier. Right. But there's yeah. definitely something different going on because I could absolutely tell you, I mean, if you were to give me a blind test and put pans in, you know, encapsulate pans in one and cubes in the other, I could tell you, you know. which one I ate. Right. You can tell it's 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 the it's the classic case of Coca Cola just tastes better than Pepsi. <laughs> yeah. So well, you got me. I mean, just hearing that because when any now I have had uh, cubes that have given me a, a really strong sense of euphoria, 
and that might be one of my more favorite aspects of them. So uh, you got me real excited and ready to do this. I got my tent ready to go, and uh, we're going to have to grow some. So how about uh, for prints or cultures? Um, is that also on that same website? No, so um, Nietzsche uh, uh, gets a lot of my prints. Um, I was moving the lab. I, I'm behind on supplying out a lot of the oh, prints. Okay, cool. Um, but yeah, mushrooms.com and Nietzsche handle most of my genetics. I've been letting some okay. uh, some dishes go here recently, um, just to kind of uh, fund the I, I, like. So the the new lab I have, I got it pretty much fit, finished. I just ordered a split system because the space didn't come with heating and air conditioning. So I struggled all all summer dealing with uh, you know it being too hot. Too and hot. now in the winter, I have space heaters in certain areas that I'm able to use. But I just got the, the split ordered, but I still have to install it. And I'm sure there's going to be a couple more things that I got to get to get it all installed and working properly so i have been letting some dishes go and uh best just pm me and i'll see what i have available to go now um, so you you're on facebook yeah uh you said discord although i'm not on your discord i didn't know he had discord but um <laughs> what yeah, the discord you, name uh is oh, let me uh I, i'll copy give me one second i'll copy it and put it in the chat because it's kind of long okay cool and then, guys, I'll, I'll put that in. I try to get all these on uh, the, the description, but I'll make sure I get it added to the description as well. As well as the uh, Buy Me a Coffee site where you can sign up for his um, consult monthly uh, uh, class or, uh, I guess, buy a few other things. Or you can buy him a coffee, maybe. I don't know. He, you better be able to buy him a fucking coffee on a website called <laughs> Buy Me a Coffee. <laughs> yeah, no, that you can. You can. Uh, I, I guess it just. I didn't even realize it had that option. But yeah, people can just buy you a coffee. So every now and then, I'll get a, a notification that'll say like, "So and so buyed you a bought nice. you a coffee," and I'm like, "Oh, nice. what do I have to do?" Because like, well, I'll get a notify when I get a class sign up or substrate. Uh -huh. But yeah, it's always nice when people just you know, I appreciate what you do. Here's here's five bucks. So, but. I didn't even know that was a thing until after I was like, what are all these things? And I went back and I saw what it actually was. I, I, sent, that the, was... Uh, I, I sent the Discord name to the chat. Oh, okay, I got it here. So let me, I can pull it up too. All right, guys, too weird to live, too rare to die. I, I feel that. <laughs> feel that 100%. There you go, You, guys. of course, know who said that, right? I don't know who said that. Well, that's Hunter S. Thompson. Oh, no shit. I mean, I, I read a little bit of him in college, but uh, I didn't. I did not remember that. I don't remember a lot of my college years, man. <laughs> There's a lot of shit going on. All right, so uh, everybody got that. I will also add that to... Uh, to the description so okay facebook discord are you on instagram yes right uh i was instagram kept banning me uh -huh. um so i finally gave up um okay. i might do another one where i only upload pictures of uh spores and like right. agar growth but they've at first the pans were slipping through the cracks i guess because they didn't have them uh they, they they weren't recognizing them right. as active mushrooms and uh after a few months I think they figured it out. <laughs> um, I know some people. Yeah, I just I had to just clean mine up for the same reason. Um, but some people are saying that in story, if you do a story, that the algorithm doesn't seem to be tracking that. Or oh, sometimes, really? sometimes. So the other thing you can do is take your phone and pull something up, you know, an image up on a computer or whatnot, and then take a picture of that, like a skew a little bit. Um, you're just trying to like find a way so that it's a little harder for the for the robots to figure you out. Yeah, I uh, I, th th I got really bummed out. I got up to a couple thousand followers on Instagram on my first profile. I think I got up to like three or four, and uh, then they and then kicked they me. And then I made a down, second yeah. one, and I was totally expecting to, for them to grab me right away. 
and they let me go for a couple months and then as soon as i started getting back up towards a thousand two thousand followers they got me again so i just gave up jake that's how they fucking break you man <laughs> they're just trying to break us god damn it no it's uh so i just watched this show on netflix called coded bias and it's like the uh the al when we keep talking about algorithms, I didn't even fucking know what I was saying when I was talking about them, but now I know. These computers are just given massive quantities of data, and they're just told decipher patterns. So, like, they're given your data, and they just figure you out. And then they go, oh, here, this is what this guy does, and I can predict this, and now I can make money off this guy. So these things are out of control and you know a lot of us are just like this doesn't even make sense like this guy is posting all these pictures and nothing's happening and they're the same fucking pictures that i'm posting but my account keeps getting shut down what's going on it's about the sum total of all the data that they're collecting on the other account versus the you know your account or my account and they're just coming to different conclusions and unfortunately, some of us just get stuck in this rut of the where the AI has flagged you, and then you just keep getting flagged. Yeah. Like well, I mean, I, I know a lot of the... Hello? Uh-oh. Finger on the... Oh, sorry. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> they um, won't post any fruit pictures. They'll, uh, yeah. they'll post everything but... and. They already have their followers from before when they were posting fruit pictures, and then they kind of beat the computers to the punch and got them down before they got removed from it. Oh. So they were kind of able to. But I mean, that's how I get followers. I post pictures of, of grows and fruits, and then that will get me a bunch of followers. It's kind of hard right. to get followers when you're just posting, you know, pictures of spores and mycelium. Right. right. But you can put filters on your story posts, so you can have. You can get some picks up there. It can be. Yeah, I'll, I'll give it a try. I mean, worst case, they'll just take it down again. Right. There is another. Uh, there is another call, platform called uh, DMT World. Have you heard of that? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. You're on that too, right? Yeah, I'm on there. Yeah. That okay. one's pretty cool. It it's obviously it's not as uh, it's not as fast or easy to use as some mm -hmm. of the other ones, but. A lot of really cool people on there. I like that platform. Um, but what do you guys talk about on there? <laughs> you can talk figure, about whatever you want on I there. can't figure it out. <laughs> well, speaking of that, since, since that came up, um, uh, for all you guys who have been seeing our giveaways that we've been doing for the 12 days of Christmas, um, tomorrow we'll be giving away one of these guys. It's a, a nice little e-mesh rig. Oh, cool. Uh, I'm not going to tell anybody what you do with it, but I'm going to tell you right now, if you do what you're supposed to do with it, that's the way to do it. <laughs> so anyway, uh, that's courtesy of uh, one of my Discord members who, who makes these and uh, awesome. put, put, puts it together. He says it's the way to do it, so somebody's going to get to find out tomorrow. <laughs> awesome. Fun. Yeah, the, uh, I'm also a fan of the Deems. Not, yeah, not, that uh, not, not on a regular basis, that, but, but <laughs> yeah, that that's a whole nother journey. People are like, well, assume whole like, oh, if you make it, you must do it all the time. And, Hell no. Yeah. I, maybe I'm just too old for it, or I just don't. I got too many demons for it, but it's yeah. I, once a year is pretty much my max out on it. I can't, I can't put myself oh, yeah. through much more than that. <laughs> yeah, I saw that some YouTube video, some like retired chemist. Who was just doing it every day, like like he was like he was just hitting a one hitter all day on it, and I don't know how that guy did that. Yeah, I don't know where he was. Maybe he didn't even die. Maybe he like literally reincarnated as the second Jesus or something. <laughs> I don't know. No, I anyway. I, I like making it more than I like doing it, but you know, to make it, there's only really one thing to do, <laughs> but do it. So yeah, I don't know. I just. I, I, I much I much prefer eating the mushrooms. It's much easier on my soul. <laughs> uh, I'm I'm with you. Oh yeah, it's not. Uh, the other is very intense. <laughs> yeah, it's a very intense thing. Now, so we talked about Jartha. I'm looking at my notes here, making sure I don't forget anything. Um, you also for a while messed around with some uh, humidified tubs, which you called pano tubs. 
Um, yeah, so that was basically when I, when I was talking about when I first made the the the, the Jartha tent. I first mm-hmm. tried to do it with tubs, and basically yeah. follows the exact same guidelines of rehydrating and then drying out to maximize well, Jake, evaporation. It looks simple. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> this is not my style. For me, like, I, my anxiety just goes up looking at this. I have a friend on Instagram uh, who does something like this, and it just looks, I'm like, I would knock this over. I would just, I know I would fuck everything up. I cannot do this. But I get it. It looks, I mean, it's cool. I think I'm more inclined to want to do your, uh, want to do your tent setup for sure. Yeah, that's. I mean, I, I've I've scrapped the tubs too. I mean, the tubs I did get them working. Like the the biggest problem with the tubs was it was more mushrooms than I can print. So right. I would have you know two thousand caps to print right. and not enough time to print them all. Right, like and guys, look at them. this. This is a lot of caps. That <laughs> is a lot of caps. This so those are like... all in the. Those are all in the trays. If you want to yeah. see. Do you, do you have a picture of the tubs? That's what I'm looking to see. I can send you one. I'll, I'll disappear for a second. Maybe but here, not. I'll send you one. No, just these are all like l- lower. All right, guys, we're we're getting some other some tub picks. Um. So anyway, we're uh we got about a half hour left. Uh, if people have questions, you guys want to ask, um, this would be a great. Uh, chance to do it. I see Mike Denver's got a question. We'll we'll cue his question up. But yeah, if you guys have any questions, and I'm waiting for my chime from Facebook. And if any of you guys have uh, experienced uh, this difference. Uh, you know, cubes versus pans. Uh, you can make some comments in in the the the, the comment section, and, and and I'll post them as well. Uh oh, I hope you found them. Anyway, well, so while we're waiting, um, if you haven't liked, uh, and you if you did like this podcast, and you haven't liked it, please like it. Uh, if you're not subscribed to the podcast, uh, please subscribe. Uh, you can put the notifications so, so you find out about new ones that I've scheduled and new ones that are coming up. Um, I would appreciate that. And, uh, you know, spread the spread the good word so people know this is a... If you want to just talk about mushrooms and ask questions uh, to people that you don't always get a chance to ask questions to, uh, it's a good place to do it. All right, good. We're getting a couple questions. Jake is uh, still out. So let's uh, fill this awkward silence with uh, a little update. Uh, I want to talk, talk to you guys about plans for the new year. I've done a little bit. going to go a little into more detail here. Um, oh, I think I heard a little muffle. Okay, they're him. coming in. Okay, One cool. of them is Tampanescence, and then the other two are Pans. They, I didn't have those put in albums, so I had to go find them in my re, my uh, recent pictures, which is okay. like 4,000 pictures. Oh, wow. These are awesome. Okay, great. Um, let me do it this way. Bam. Yeah, I see what you're talking about. These are tall boys. Alright, now let me convert these real quick. Sorry, a couple awkward pauses. And we'll get there. Got that converted. Now let me pull it up. Ah. Alright, tubs. 
So yeah, one of those is the the tamponessence I was talking about that were super noodly. Yeah, that one. Yeah. <laughs> that's hardcore, dude. I mean, that's just like some ugly spaghetti right there. Yeah, not good for printing. Yeah. And that's one of the pan tubs, and they were, yeah, that was uh, that was earlier on. And yeah, that that was a whole tub filled wall to wall like that. But the caps wow. were they were they were Tiny. much more smaller. Yeah. So it, I could print them, but there was just so many of them. Right. Um, I, I would I would end up missing a whole bunch of them, and you know, vendors, especially with pans and stuff, they they only each vendor will only take like two hundred at a time, max. Right. So it definitely helps to be able to have variety as opposed to. Two thousand of one type, right? All right. So uh, while you were gone, I said, "Hey, get get some questions ready. We're we're rounding the bend here, um, and with the time remaining, if you guys have any questions, uh, you know, let, let's ask them." So here we go. Uh, John Cat wants to know any thoughts on trying to grow uh, pans in bags. Um, no, I have not. I've never tried it. I've seen a couple other people do okay with them. Um, mm -hmm. and, but again, you get more noodly fruits. Um, it's definitely doable. I did just for my purposes of printing them. It doesn't seem to be ideal. Um, but that doesn't mean that your purposes might be different and right. you know, your space. I'm not, it's definitely not impossible. Cool. Uh, next question. Uh, just one of my MVP superstars in my Discord. This guy is like one of the nicest guys uh, in the world. Uh, what would Jake say was his hardest strain to cultivate, or, or, or species, or variety, or whatever? Neopensis, definitely uh, the most difficult. And uh, I, I only ever got to pins, and then I had to move everything. Um, but I failed with attempts on that. I don't even know how many times before I ever even got a couple pins to come up. Um, Subtropicalis can be can be difficult too, just because of how long it takes before they start to fruit, and you can right. do everything right, and then you just a trick a trick just happened to land on the sub somewhere, and um, but th th those are are much more more doable. You just got to make sure that your fruiting chamber is nice clean. and clean. Right. <laughs> Cool. All right. Uh, another question, Brett uh, Schneider. How long do pans, I, I'm assuming on average, take uh, from agar to harvest? So if if you have uh, optimized all the uh, all the um, stages and you have a good culture, it should take about seven days at each stage. Seven to ten days. So oh, wow. Seven to ten days to eat the dish. Another yeah. seven to ten days to eat the spawn jar another seven to 10 days to eat your substrate and then about three to five days till pins seven to 10 days to wow. harvest. Nice. And sometimes it'll move a little slower than that. Usually if it moves slower than that, the yields aren't as good and you're going to get more sporadic clusters. Um, Bisporus moves a little slower. Um, it, it's more like 10 to 15 days at each stage. And uh, okay. the pan bisporus mycelium is gray, so just if anyone's growing wow. bisporus, keep that in mind that it's gonna it's gonna look gray. Tamponescence also looks a little gray. Hmm. Uh, yeah, it does. You're right. Um, I got got some in jars right now, and I'm like, oh, it's like cobwebs. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Got. Got. I kind of like this question. Uh, Super Spooker wants to know if you could get one lost print back, which print would it be? Uh, the um, uh, uh, the original uh, um, uh, Huga Shinji uh, um, Umbone. I, I really had I had one. Joke. So there's lots of Huga Shinji uh, convexa going around, but the acute yeah. Umbone uh, is very hard to come by, and I uh, it, it, it I lost it. Like I mean, I have it, but it won't germinate. Oh. Supposedly, Nichi Maiko has one. Um, I've heard lots of people tell me they have them and then they grow it and it's convexa. So mm -hmm. I'm hoping that he actually has the acute All right. Next question, uh, Jason Blackburn. What's your favorite pan variety from uh, the experience standpoint? Um, probably either the PHV or uh, Pan Cam Indonesia. Both of those are really uh, 
every time I take them, they are uh, quite quite intense and very enjoyable. Um, nice. Also, very uh, you know, it'll definitely sit you down and make you question your existence for a few days after. But uh, they're they're very they're very uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Impactful. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, another question from Brett. Uh, how much experience with cubes gourmets would you suggest before tackling pans and other exotics? And then recommendation on your first non-cube species. Um. So the 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 main thing with growing like the experience standpoint is your agar experience. Um, being able, you know, your sterile tech. Uh, have, having all that kind of under under control, just because you you are going to be given less uh, less breaks with with, with pans and, and other right. more difficult species. I don't think that you necessarily have to grow, you know, fifty tubs of cubes before you can try it. But if you're sure. if you're good on agar and you know your 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 contamination rate is pretty low, um, I'd say that you're good. To, uh, you're good to make an attempt. Um, just be ready to have some failures and don't let that, don't let that, uh, deter you. Right. And just to chalk one up as a learning experience and go back at it. Yeah. I would say my take on this, not from experience, but just from what I see with other people, some people can tolerate the failure. Some people expect it. They, they think it's normal to not be perfect out of the gate. A lot of people, however, seem to really need that that early win. Um, I've seen people fail once and then go, "I don't know if I should keep going." And I was like, "Dude, like, <laughs> you're you're you need to adjust your mindset here. And every tub is not going to be a slam dunk." Yeah, I, I mean, like I said, I failed for eight months straight, like not a single pen before right. I before I got my first pans. And I mean, I was. I was start, I started with pretty much just running them like cubes. I figured I, I would start there, and of course not with cocoa core, but you know. And then right. I slowly just kept adapting everything, and then I got some pins, and I kept what worked, and got right. rid of you know everything that didn't, and uh, eventually it worked out. But yeah, I mean, I can't tell you how many jars and, and tubs and trays I threw out before right. I started having success. Now, but you had, so you had a few things though. You had an early experience and already a relationship and a love for, for the mushrooms. And this was just a new variety, right? Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of these newbies, they don't have any of that. And some of them, I mean, you would not believe some people want to start like, they're like, yeah, I'm just, I'm brand new. I think I'm going to try ghost first. Like, yeah, no, or Aziz. No. I'll see that. Don't. People will be yeah, like, they'll no. look up the most potent mushroom and be like, I want to grow Aziz. That's what I'm going to grow first, right? <laughs> no. You need to grow the just some boring-ass cubes, man. Just learn how to grow something first and then slowly work your way up, yeah. Yeah, and that'll also give you the confidence boost and kind of exactly. you know, get, you, get you excited about it. It's hard to get excited about something when... If you just keep failing. Yes. Right, exactly. All right, next question. I like this one too, Jesse Lee. Are pans not as prone to mutation as cubes? The phenos don't seem as varied at this point. Um, yeah. So it it, it I do have dwarf phenos, um, and then like the the Cambo Indonesia has wavy caps, and okay. I'm working on trying to breed those those more um those more unique appearance phenos into right. other strains um but yeah especially like throughout different strains of pan cyans i mean a pan cyan is pretty much a pan cyan uh, they're all gonna look pretty similar phv with the purple spores um is pretty much the most unique and it's it's not even pan cyan it, it's a cross of tropicalis and pan cyan um but right. yeah, it's definitely not as varied as cubes in terms of you know squats and albino ghost and, <laughs> and and they just they they're like you were saying earlier they're not as prissy or temperamental they're more forgiving you can you know you can rib them a little bit like they they lend themselves to being worked more too I think 
Yeah. Do you want some pictures of the of the the um, dwarf? Oh yeah, for sure. And somebody was mentioning uh, pics of s some other non pan cyans that you were talking about. Yeah, I can do that. We love the pics, but definitely the dwarfs. Yes, definitely uh, I anything uh, out of the ordinary. Cool guys. Well, while he's doing that, um, somebody asked, "How do you do all this?" It is very challenging. Um, Luckily, I am no longer doing a 9 to 5 where um, I have more free time. I'm currently working a .6 position at the hospital until uh, a new job comes in. So I'm having a little bit more free time, but I definitely, it's always a struggle. Uh, dialing back on the grow for sure. All right, I think he just sent me some, some pictures here. Here we go. Oh, yeah, these are cool. Holy shit. Are these actually? All right, guys, you're going to like this. Let me get them converted. Okay. Thank God I'm not a boomer. I, I'm no offense to boomers, but I, this this is already taking too long. If my dad was doing this, dear God, we'd be here till four in the morning. What I do, I, I feel like right now I know how they must feel when I watch them do stuff on the computer. They don't know what the fuck they're doing. All right, here we go. This is being uploaded. Processing. All right, I think he messaged me a few more. Holy shit, okay. Yeah, dude, uh, you know what? I'm gonna share these a different way. I'll, I'll go through these first few this way, and then I'm gonna actually share my screen because this other, this other process will take too long. Uh, yeah, so no, I, I just, I, I sent you a bunch of each and I, I, uh, okay, cool. I figured you would just kind of pick which ones you wanted to show. <laughs> so now these are your dwarfs. Yep. Now this is cool, man. There's lots of morphology here. There's that cool little ring. Um, you know. Well, oh, actually, that some... picture right there that's up, that is Bisporus. I must have accidentally oh, okay. clicked on that one. Those right. are the dwarfs there. Okay, these are the dwarfs. Okay. Yeah, and those are pan. <clears throat> those are actually pan cam cross uh, pan shop dwarfs. All right. How do we get our hands on those? In you know, Jake, you're living in an era right now of cross frenzy. It is all about the crosses right now, and we want them. <laughs> so how do we get our hands on some of these crosses? So this cross is actually one of the few that I haven't released yet, just because okay. it's very problematic still. Okay. Um, and I'm trying to I'm trying to dial it into where there people are going to have more success with them than failure. Um, sure. But I still have them. I'm still working on them. And once I'm happy with them, I will release them. But, yeah, cool. they're uh, they're very temperamental. You can tell me the truth. I know you and Tim Pig are just plotting <laughs> the greatest genetics release of all time. It's okay. I know what you're doing. Okay, hold on. Uh, so I'm going to pull up the other screen here. Uh, he's got lots of good pictures of some of the other stuff here. So I think these next ones are PanCam Indonesia's. Let me get the screen up. All right. Share screen. Here we go. All right. All right, so I'm going to have to be on the other screen to screen through these. So, yeah, if you want to talk these through as I'm moving through them. And that's th those right there are the dwarfs again. Okay. Here we go. That's Mexicana, or Tampanessence, rather. Gosh, darn it. That's a uh, Facebook page, I think. That's my Facebook <laughs> page. Here we go. 
There you go. There's the pan cam Indonesia. Oh, uh, those are cool. Okay. Yeah, like they that. those got those really really thick wavy caps, and those things pack a hell of a punch. Nice. Um, oh yeah, and they're they're a little bit larger too, huh? Yep. Yeah, nice. they're they're a little thicker. Oh, and, dang it. Uh, there's another Facebook page. <laughs> I, keep, I keep losing my the where my arrow is keeps changing. Sorry. Okay, here's another yep. one. Yep. More Indo. Dwarfs again. Oh, okay, sorry. I think I gotta move on to the next. All right. So then, let's pull that up. There's PHV. So those ah, are actually, those go. are actually white until the spores drop and then they right. turn purple. And <clears throat> originally, PHV started where I had the Pan Cyan Hasteca. And they were virtually sporeless. So I was okay. trying to increase their spore production. And then I uh, decided to breed them with, the, while I got better spore production, I decided to breed them with the red spore to see if I could get more production and red spores. And it mm -hmm. turned purple. And uh, yeah, that was my first cross. Well, that about makes sense, right? Black and red, purple. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Look at that, man, just stacking trays. That's what I like to see. Ooh, that's a good picture right there. That's an Instagram picture for sure. Uh, there's the endos again. I might be back. I think I'm back through those. Okay, all right, we did that. All right. nice. <clears throat> so I'm pretty sure the next one's gonna be the, uh, the other species. What other? Oh, here we go. Yeah, okay, sorry. Uh, pull that back on. There we go. Is there you go. There's subtropicalis. Okay. Uh, more subtropicalis. And then there's a different pheno of subtropicalis, which was a different print. I think it was actually mislabeled. There's the section zapotecorum. Ah, so that's, okay. That's the relative of subtropicalis. Um, but you can tell it's pretty different. <laughs> so so this grows similar to subtropicalis or differently? Like as uh, far as considerations? Uh, similar. Um, I, I did I, I did it. Pretty differently. The subtropicalis seem to do fine on cocoa core. They just move slower. Mm -hmm. These were actually grown on sugarcane bagasse with uh, sugarcane bagasse, some manure, and then the uh, grass casing. Okay. So these are a little tr these are tricky. Yeah, I don't know if yeah. it has to be done that way. That's okay. just the way I did it. Ooh. And Alan took those pictures. He, all these pictures here, Alan was, oh, yeah, uh, Alan was over nice. and he took these. You can tell they're much prettier. <laughs> okay, I think we're back there. I think I got all of them. Yeah. Yeah, I did. I have okay. more. I just, I'd have to go through and hunt through, and I, I don't have all of them putting albums right now, so. That's okay. That's cool, man. So, um,. Right now, uh, for classes and one-on-ones and uh, stuff like that, it's it's the the coffee website for uh, prints and whatnot. It's just uh, hit up the DMs. Yeah, buymeacoffee.com okay. forward slash Jake on it. Perfect. Yeah, I I'll, I'll have uh, the, I got to add the DMT world thing, um, but I have the I think I have the coffee uh, website linked already. If not, I'll, I'll add it. Yeah, my, my helper set up the buy me a coffee thing. I'd never even heard of it, but it's, it's pretty nice. I mean, I, I'm, I, I like using it, and it hasn't locked me out yet, so. Nice. Yeah. Um, okay, <laughs> one more question, and then I think we're caught up. Um, do you just, is it, does it matter what light you use in, in the tents for the, for pans? No, um, 
don't you don't need special grow lights or anything. I just use under cabinet LEDs, and then I found some waterproof strips, which obviously with the the high humidity, right. it's nice to have those. But no, just as long as they get some light and some dark, um, gotcha. they'll be fine. Nice. I did some experimenting with using uh, LED grow lights, um, and it it didn't make any difference. I mean, they work fine. It's just right. not needed. Very cool. All right, man. I think we did it. I, awesome. I definitely feel a lot more uh, confident in thinking about doing this. Um, I probably need to look up and see if Nikki's still got some of that uh, poo sub. I, I probably would prefer doing it that way uh, for my first time out. But, man, I'm excited. I, I got a humidified tent and I'm ready to go. You can get the, the poo sub from the buy me a coffee thing also. Oh, cool. Know. Oh, great. He, great. It okay. still has the listings up. He, he does send a couple my way. Um, okay. I do a lot of sales where I do it at, uh, I, I do $20 off just because by the time it goes through a vendor for, you know, them to get their piece and then me to cover my expenses plus the shipping is 22 you end up, right. you know, it ends up getting pretty pricey. So um, I try and do, uh, the twenty dollar off sales every nice. couple weeks, so I'll probably do one here uh, for this this weekend coming up. Um, Perfect. And then yeah, I have I made a bunch of duplicate dishes, um, just to kind of uh, fund this split system I got to put in. So if anybody wants some dishes, uh, PM me and we'll we'll see what we can put together. I will be doing that. All right, guys. Uh, thanks again, uh, Jake. Thank you so much. Uh, it, it's been, you know, I trying to go to the source every time. You know, I, I, I want the I, I want the people who who birth the the interest, which I, I think you really can absolutely take that credit. And uh, you got a lot of people growing pans because of you. So uh, we are indebted to you. And in general, in this community, uh, there's a lot of great people like you who are doing a lot of work. I think my takeaway tonight is just like, God damn, this guy's done a lot of work. <laughs> this is a lot of fucking work. Yeah. So we, I, I thank you. Um, I think a, a lot of other people thank you for, for, for that. Um, yeah, and, no, I, I love doing it. I, uh, I did. I definitely did have to quit my job. I, when I first started, I was working as an electrician and doing both. Man, it was mm -hmm. just, you, I, you, you, you got to not sleep. And uh, at a right. certain point, I had to just decide what I wanted to do. And, right. uh, you know, definitely have to suffer for it. I and mean, didn't take a take an income for like two years, but hopefully yeah. it'll, it'll be worth it in the end. Yep. Cool, man. Well, I, I think you're doing great. And uh, I love that you're uh, spreading the, the good word about these. And now you really got me wanting to try them. Because uh, they sound fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, if if you uh, if you read like the other people's responses, um, it's pretty much the same as mine. Is you get a lot of people that will say, you know, I'll never be able to eat cubes again. Wow. Which I don't know about that. I I just because of my stomach. But right. I think cubes have their own thing to offer. But uh, you yeah, know, they are they are definitely a, a unique experience, and uh, you should definitely give it a try can't wait i'm literally very excited thank you uh thanks again uh don't forget guys enter the the 12 days giveaways uh we're we're going all 12 days who knows how far we're gonna go we're just gonna uh keep giving shit away so everybody keeps growing mushrooms <laughs> all right <laughs> uh, thanks so much oh yeah thank you very much uh next week we have uh hyphae not husbands i got some of the the legendary female mycologist coming on. They're going to talk about uh, what it's like being a girl in a very boy-oriented culture uh, and uh, talk about the cool-ass shit all these ladies are doing, man. They're, they're you know, they're, they're, they're really solid growers. So we're, we're going to talk about, talk about that next week, so stay tuned. All right, man. You have a good night. See ya. Bye, everybody.